Now, this is what we could call a peroxide. Uh, a peroxide is when you have two oxygens bound to each other. We haven't really seen any cases with two oxygens bound to each other. So when you see two oxygens bound to each other, that's a peroxide. And this is going to be a radical mechanism. Since it's a radical mechanism, we have to start using single handed arrows. The first step is where we need a little energy from the light. Let's see if you can draw the products from that step. seem too confident about that, but you came up with the right answer. What these arrows mean is that each of these oxygens is uh, taking one of the uh, electrons from the bond. So each oxygen will end up with a kind of Ah, well, where's the head of the arrow? Notice that the head of the arrow here is pointing to the oxygen. Mm -hmm. That means that it's the oxygen that's going to get that unpaired electron. And this is just technicality, but I guess we'll get two equivalents of this. The next step is this. So let's see if we can draw the products from this step. Remember that when you're doing radical mechanisms, you use single-headed arrows, and if you're forming a bond, you show the two arrows pointing to each other. We don't do this when we're moving pairs of electrons, but when you're doing a radical mechanism to form a bond, you show the two arrows pointing towards each other. I'm going to keep drawing the dots for all the electrons that are moving around. All right, and now that puts the radical on the bromine here. By the way, notice that in radical mechanisms, there are no charges, but there's unpaired electrons. So we have to keep track of the unpaired electrons. So who is the reactive atom from these intermediates? So let's see what the, the bromine radical will do. Well, now we can finally pull in the alkene. Let's uh, simplify this a little by taking off that methyl group. I don't want to get into the, that issue there. So let's do, do this. We're going to do this. So let's see if we can draw the intermediate from that step. Number of your carbons here. It's a very common mistake to lose or drop a carbon there. So we can see here that the number two is forming a bond to the bromine. So I think that originally you just drew the bromine here, but that would obliterate the number two carbon. So we have to actually draw the new bond. 
between the number two and the bromine. Uh, if you actually show the electrons that are moving around, it's harder to make that mistake over here. And also, if you number, it's harder to lose or drop a carbon. Um, and I think you correctly showed that now the unpaired electron is over here. Now, wait a second. Um, it seems like the bromine could have attacked the number one, and that would have left the unpaired electron in the number two. So how do we know which one it's going to do? Is the bromine going to attack the two and leave the unpaired electron on the one, or is the bromine going to attack the one and leave the unpaired electron on the two? The bromine's going to attack the two because the one is more stable. That's right. And this is for the same reason that a substituted carbocation is more stable. Uh, does this have too many electrons or too few? Uh, a radical. Does a radical have too many or too few electrons? Few. Too few, because it only has seven and it wants eight. Just like a carbocation has too few. So what does it want to be surrounded by? It wants as many electron donating substituents as possible. Well, we have memorized that carbon chains, alkyl groups, are electron donating. So just like substitution stabilizes carbocations, substitution also stabilizes radicals. Because both carbocations and radicals are electron deficient, and substitution with carbon chains stabilizes them because carbon chains, also known as alkyl groups, are electron donating. All right, so that's that same issue here. So um, the bromine could have attacked either carbon, but it's going to prefer to attack the number two because that will leave the radical on the number one. So who's the reactive atom in this case? Um, the carbon chain. Which carbon is reactive? Number one carbon. That's right. We always want to be specific about the precise atom that's the reactive atom, not just the molecule. So now this is going to have to react with somebody. It's not a bad guess, but it turns out that we should focus on something different. Now we should take another HBr and do this reaction. So let's see if we can draw the products from this step. are chain mechanisms. So this is really the product that we're interested in right here. Here's the product. Here's the product that we're getting that we're interested in. Over here. All this bromine is going to do is produce more of that product. The bromine is going to go back to this step and go through the steps that will give us a, a more of this product. We don't need to keep following it. Eventually, there'll be termination steps, but we're usually not interested in drawing the termination steps. So this is as much of a mechanism as we're going to be interested in drawing for this radical. So what's this called? This is not electrophilic addition anymore. It's radical addition. This is a radical addition because the attacker is not an electrophile, but a radical. I think this is a pretty complicated mechanism, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you had to do this on the test. So you basically just have to take a piece of paper and keep doing, draw, writing it down over and over uh, until you basically have it memorized. But isn't it pretty much the same as like, I mean, it's the same steps as the first types of radicals we learned about, but it just has an alkene involved, right? In, and the steps are very similar to radical substitution, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, you, this does take extra practice. Okay. Uh, for one thing, we didn't have any peroxides involved in the radical substitution. So there are similarities, you're right, between this and radical substitution, but I think it's a little harder, a little bit more complicated. Again, so that's the key. Mm -hmm. So it's ROH, it's not an ether, but it's uh, an alkene. Yeah, this is an alcohol. We're not actually all that interested in this product, though. Um, what the main thing we're interested in making is this. We're interested in what's going to happen to the alkene over so here. So when, when we use the peroxide, it doesn't actually form anything we're interested in because right. the DR is in the, in the H that are being used. Yeah, that's well put. The only purpose of the peroxides here is to help us turn these into radicals. Remember, it's not that easy to form radicals. Nature doesn't like radicals. It's not that easy to form them. 
Uh, it turns out here, though, that if we have some peroxides, it's not too hard to make peroxide radicals. And then the only real purpose of the peroxide radicals is to make the HBr into a Br radical. And then after it's done that, we don't really care about it anymore. In a way, it's just a technicality. And that's something that we didn't have to use for the radical substitution. So that's one way that this is more complicated. <laughs>